Hello world, this is Zan. Going to be doing a national overview for MA Miglin. I feel I'm at a decent enough point in, uh, I have two Miglin games going on right now, one in Dominion's Enhanced, one without it. And I'll go over the Dominion's Enhanced version maybe in a second video that I'll do for their spells and maybe sacred units, their summons. Uh, so for now, I'm going to try to keep this plain to vanilla. And then in a separate video is where I'll do uh, the Dominion's Enhanced spells. So going in, it almost looks like it's the other the Miklans of the other ages with a few very important and key differences. One, their bless points are now going to be air and nature. That's going to be uh, probably the first thing you notice if you go from top to bottom. Uh, second, they have almost no blood magic, whereas in early age and late age these mages were astro two blood two, and probably a hundred gold more expensive. They have lost that right. Uh, they cannot get blood magic. Uh, they cannot random it. Nothing. Next, they have recruitable quaddles in their capital. And they are... They can be better or at worst different than the summoned one. All, all Miklans and Sittis even can summon these quaddles for 40 gems. So this is a 40 gem unit here. Now, the summon variety is Astral 3, Nature 3. That's it. This does not change. The recruitable variety is Astral 3 and is, is either an Astral 3. Well, it, it can get these randoms. How's that? <laughs> Very often, I personally end up seeing them as Astral 3 Nature 3 or Astral 3 Air 2. I, I don't see them mix often. It's kind of funny. Uh, and then very rarely, they'll, they'll random another Astral Path. I wouldn't count on it. Um, they also get these High Priests of the Sky, which are going to be an Air 2 Holy 3 Mage that can fly, although just in case, it, although it flies, it still has very low map moves. This is something to keep in mind. It's going to ignore terrain, but it's still not going to go very far. And his randoms are actually, you know, the, the, the main other elements that you get in this nation. And then another 10%. Uh, <laughs> technically, uh, this, is, this will never happen in a real game. And I say this as it happened to me. Technically, this guy can random nature and water and become a foul vapors caster. I say this only because it happened to me, but the chances of that are so minuscule that I wouldn't count on it. And that that when and if that happens is very important because odds are you're going to have poison resistance on your nation, and your nation is going to be the way I play Miklan is almost exclusively sacreds only. The exception to this are the Nahuali, which feature at least to me they feature more prominently in the Middle Age Miklan. Because your other mages, your other non-capital mages, are not good. <laughs> They're just frankly not good. There's not much for them to cast without significant gem investment. Gems that you need to be doing other things with. So in the Middle Age, you will lean on the Nahuali more. Uh, Nahuali are really good because an Astral 1, Nature 2, on its own is good. They research, I mean, for 125 you get 11 research points. That's not horrible. That's almost on point. Uh, they have forest survival. They give you supplies because of the nature math. They have spirit sight, which I don't think is ever going to do much for you. They have a turkey shape that has less hit points than the human shape. It can fly very far, mind you. And it has uh, a ranged attack that will cast uh, enrage on somebody. Enrage makes units... It's almost like Berserk in that they won't route. They will run around mindlessly if there's nothing around them. But if there are things, they have a uh, half and half chance of targeting your units or targeting the fr their friendly units. So if there's nothing for them to cast, you can have these guys on fire. Just note, it only has five ammunition. So after that, they go kind of scriptless. And if they don't have any spells to cast while scriptless, they will try to fight things. And that's not a good idea with the turkey. Um, other things that's good about having the turkey with less hit points, you want them researching in turkey form. Because if, say, like, flames from the sky or seeking arrow or something like that happens they'll just they, they can't get killed by it it's difficult because they'll swap to their human shape um the rest of the mages it's kind of like the sky priest here it's 70 gold seven research sacred patrol bonus fortune teller really really good but he's air one holy one there's not much for him to cast especially because although this eight nation has a very strong air focus it is difficult to cast Storm with it. Uh, they have a 10% random for these other paths. 
And if you build a lot of these, and you should, you should have a very good amount of these because they're good research monkeys at the end of the day, uh, you'll have frequent amounts of these paths. And with gems, they can do stuff. Like the fire variety can do uh, sulfur haze. The water variety can do uh, freezing mist. Astral means it can be a communion slave for a uh, uh, what is it? high priest of the sky communion master. Uh, so th there are things they can do. And when they random, they're infinitely better because now they're 70 gold for nine research. And the only reason that the random is even relevant at 10% is just because you can mass these like no other. Um, you've also got the Miklum Priest, which is 65 gold for seven research. But these are much more difficult to use um, without gems. And again, when I say difficult to use, you can use these with gems. Like a fire one with fire gems can Phoenix power into fire two. And then with even more gems can cast fire three spells. You know, same goes for all of these paths. And the, the astral ones are infinitely more useful because obviously they can do, they can be communion slaves for your Nahuali or whatever. Nahuali can do their own communion slaves. So that's another story. <laughs> um, on your capital, you have the rain priest, which is a water two. And again, these are all fast recruits. The only slow to recruit on your capital is the quaddle. Um, but again, on your capital, you have water twos, which are crazy useful. You have, damn it, I clicked them twice, didn't I? You have astral twos, which as M.A. Micklin, you will never recruit this unit. Let me stress that. Never recruit this unit because you have better astral on the quaddle and you have worse astral on your Nwali. There is no... I don't. I personally do not see a point where you ever will recruit a moon, moon priest. The closest thing I could ever see for him is your blood empowering him to cast lesser horrors or summon one of the, their unique sacreds that's blood astral cross path. Never recruit this. Your capital is so important. <laughs> um, you have fire twos, which are useful in that they have troop leadership that your other mages might not have. Uh, that's very relevant in the early game, where 135 gold is significantly less than your other troop leaders that are 210 gold, 225 gold, slow to recruit 300 gold. So this guy can come in clutch in that early game as you're just you just need a commander, but you also don't want to waste a turn making tribal kings. Not on your capital. These are great commanders, not on your capital. Um, you have priest kings, which are nature two holy threes. These are your best commanders. Uh, plus two leadership normally. They also give Taskmaster bonus to slaves. They can all capture slaves, which I guess I could have mentioned this with the other commander. Capture slave gives you this guy that looks exactly like this with a spear. They're okay, Seed Shaft. They're mainly there to put, help patrol uh, when you blood hunt. And we'll get the blood hunting on the station later. They, these guys can also ran the magic. And the tiny amount that hit water one, again, they can foul vapors, which is kind of useful. But it's also difficult to justify recruiting too many of these because they don't give you any magic diversity. You have Nature 2 on the Nahuali that you, as M.A. Mithlin, are probably mass producing. So it's, again, it's difficult to justify recruiting the Priest King and the Moon Priest. That is not to say I don't recruit Priest Kings. Sometimes I really want that leadership. But not always. <laughs> um, just to finish up, I guess, the rest of their lineup, regular scout. Slave Hunter. And yeah, OK, that's most of them. That's most of them. I'm not even really going into what they can do. But primarily, me personally, I will spend a lot of time in the early game recruiting Sun Priests that are Fire 2 and Rain Priests that are Water 2. Because I want to site search everything as soon as I can for Water and Fire. Fire so that I can create Lightless Lanterns at Construction 6. And I have had the fire income ticking up the entire game, because there's not really much else to spend your fire gems on as the Sage Micklin. So you've had that income, that fire income that you site searched, ticking up all game. So when you hit construction six, you can mass produce light lanterns. You'd mass produce them with these guys that are done site searching. Or if you start recruiting a few Micklin priests, sometimes they can get fire one and they can craft them for you. Uh, the rain priests are useful for two things. One, with water with scuba gear, they can go underwater and summon water lentils. Very good down there. <laughs> Be hilarious if you gave them natural water breathing. They're very good underwater. They can take lakes for you. They can attack things for you. Great. Uh, two, on land, they can cast quickness. 
I haven't gone over their units yet, but the Miklan Sacreds really, really like quickness. It is a very important, very useful buff for them. <laughs> okay, what else do we have here? Uh, as the game progresses, um, I don't really recruit as many water or fire mages. I start recruiting primarily high priests of the sky because they are air twos. They can cloud trapeze, they're holy threes, they can preach really high, they can divine blessing. They're just all around a very good cat mage that you get a lot of. I also get some quaddles, not too many. They have specific purposes. Uh, obviously, they're going to cast you the big astral spells. Anti magic is huge on this nation. When we get to the troops, I'll outline just how bad, badly you need to be casting anti-magic. Um, but another purpose I use them for a lot is casting gateway. You give them a crown of command, and then they ga they can the gateway around troops for you. Crown of command and a crystal coin, and they'll gateway for you. It's very useful for sneaking armies around from across the entire darn map, and nobody expects it, because you're Miklin. Miklin doesn't have big astral, right? No one not many people know how to fight against them in this one. It's weird. Uh, they're just really good mages. They're just expensive. You know, you can get two of these guys for every one of those. It's choices. The capital is contentious. Now, off to the units. Uh, these three, is it these three? No, these two are pretty much the same unit. It's a guy with a stick and a spear, uh, a stick and a sling, and they're going to throw things, and one has armor and the other one doesn't. Um... They're absurdly cheap, with the armorless one actually having one resource. In the early game, they there's things you can do with them. Like, this guy is actually surprisingly good against barbarians that don't wear helmets. And since they're so absurdly cheap to recruit, you can get, like, 50 of these guys right out the gate and just go send them to pop a big barbarian province. That would otherwise be scary to your other units. So there is a purpose for them. This one, not as much, because, yeah, he's got armor, but it kind of sucks. And you're not really big on resources, that's Miklin. Uh, this is a, here is a average unit, and as best as average can be. It's a guy with the spear, a javelin, which is always good. But his stats are crap. His saving grace is he has 9 gold instead of 10 gold, and 7 recruitment points instead of whatever. Yeah, <laughs> he exists. This guy decided to wear a little bit more armor, but his stats are still garbage. So again, it's they're okay. Like these aren't terrible units because they're cheap. They're really cheap. They're just okay <laughs> at best. Uh, the Moon Warrior now. This is actually very different. This guy costs 14 recruitment points, 14 resources, 12 gold. This is a this is a real unit right here. Um, his stats, while his defense skill is terrible, his attack skill is acceptable. Uh, he's actually two-handing a weapon that will hit fairly hard. You can say he's wearing some for Miklin, what is considered heavy armor. <laughs> and uh, for whatever reason, he does have Dark Vision 50. I mean, it's explained here in the lore. If this guy was sacred, holy crap, he'd be amazing. For now, he's what you build if you were Scales Miklin. But if you're Scales Miklin, the rest of this guide and everything I've been saying is probably useless to you. <laughs> uh, we're going to skip over these two sacreds and go to the Feathered Warrior. This is a unit. You can recruit him. You may want to recruit a few of them because of the standard effect. That's about it. Like if you're finding somebody that uses awe on their bless, I can justify recruiting a few of these to give you guys the standard. That's about it though. <laughs> That's about it though. Um, I hardly recruit them. Okay. Now the rest of the units, there's kind of huge. If you didn't tank all of your scales, which is possible. There's people that don't tank all their scales for some reason that I personally won't understand. But uh, you can recruit this guy. He is not bad as a sacred. Um, his worst feature is actually his map move is 8. Uh, whereas the rest of the nation, your mages have map move 16. Your other sacreds have map move 14. Your commanders, these guys, have map move 10. It's kind of awkward. And these are even slower at map move 8. I don't know why they're slower. Because you see their base map move 14, but everyone else is like base map move 16. I don't know why. It's really weird to me. But uh, their stats are good. Protection, good. 
They come with natural fire resistance, which is also good. Uh, they hit really hard with the hatchet. They have javelin, and they're fairly armored. They actually have this bronze cap where the other units have this weird situation you almost never see where their head armor is worse than their body armor. And uh, the Sun Warrior kind of fixes that. Kind of cool. Uh, and now for the uh, meat and potatoes of the nation. We're going to start with the Jaguar Warrior, because in the Middle Age, the Jaguar Warrior is capital only. You can only recruit him in the cap. Now, this guy's fantastic. There's so much you can do with him. In the Middle Age, I don't think there's a lot you, sh you should do with him. Uh, depending on your bless, the best value you can get out of this guy is the fact that he has a two-handed weapon, will be affected by your bless, which I hope has strength in it, and he could chew through beefy units. He will swing and hit things very hard. Um, decent stats. Kind of expensive for a unit at 26 gold. Almost no resource costs, but extremely high recruitment point costs. This this is the guy that in the early age, late age Micklands prevents you from just going turmoil three. You cannot go turmoil three with those nations because yes, you might be able to recruit seven of these guys out of your capital, but I'm gonna rain your parade here, you know, spoilers. Most of your sacred recruitment is not coming out of your capital. Not as Mickland. So that high recruitment point cost actually forces you to take either order neutral or order scales. Um, so to the, what he does, in his human form, he's going to have a very strong singular hit. In his, once they go to, once they die, I can't even say zero hit points, because usually if, if you're using these guys, you want to have undying as part of your bless. Once their human shape dies, they go to their jaguar shape. Now, going to their jaguar shape refreshes, I guess, what undying would be, refreshes luck. It puts him back to full health in Jaguar shape, or if the damage bleeds over. And now they're going to have three attacks, uh, a bite and two claw attacks, which, as they lose arms, can be reduced. And it's going to do strength damage. So if they have 11 strength, those three attacks will do 11 each. And three attacks per unit. Kind of really good. This is why I say you quickness is very favored, because it's going to give them really good stats, and it's going to make them attack a lot. You want to quicken your dudes. Sucks that your Water 2 Mage is cap only. <laughs> um, so this is very, very high damage. And it's just it has very little armor and not the greatest defense. So it's a sack of hit points. I have very unique blesses when it comes to making Jaguar Wars. But again, this guide is for Middle Age Miklum. I don't use these. I do not use these as Middle Age Miklum. I tried, and both times I have tried, they have let me down. Moving on. Meat and potatoes of the nation, right here. The Eagle Warrior. In the Middle Age, you can recruit this guy everywhere. Any single fort with a temple can recruit them. It doesn't look like much. He has worse stats than the Jaguar Warrior. Yeah. Uh, mainly that one less defense. However, he is dual wielding a lance and a dagger, both which are piercing weapons, which means they are valued higher when fighting uh, high protection targets, aka they're going to scale longer in the game as people start getting access to iron warriors marble marble warriors or whatever the heck uh they've got the same armor same encumbrance Matt move 14. uh however if you notice they cost significantly less than the jaguar warrior you can get three of these for every two jaguar warriors uh the, the resource cost is negligible negligible and the recruitment po point cost is about half which means as ma micklin uniquely you can take turmoil three and not give a damn. You cannot care. That's an extra 120 design points that you can now get because this sacred is not only cheaper than the Jaguar Warriors, you don't need the gold as much, but he doesn't have a high recruitment point limit. So uh, at least for me, a 10,000 population province in Turmoil 3 can recruit 8 to 10 of these guys without a problem. And what more can you ask for? Now, he has the unique thing going for him is that the moment he is blessed, they can fly in combat. And there's a lot you can do with that. Uh, let's say you're fighting an air nation. You know they're going to cast Storm so that so you don't fly at them. You can bless turn one and have these guys on attack. You don't not hold an attack, just attack. And they will get to the enemy before Storm goes off. Or they'll start flying before Storm goes off, better said. Um, you can have them on hold and attack rear. 
and then you don't bless them until turn four or turn five. And all of a sudden they start flying then, and all the, all the people that your opponent had on hold and attack, they're gone. They have left to join the front lines. The only thing that's going to be back there is going to be bodyguards. And now all of a sudden all your eagle warriors show up. Um, there's a trick with, I think, line formation that that will also prevent them from flying if you don't want them to. But uh, yeah, they, my main thing is they fly. And they have a lance. It's a light lance, I guess, because you're going to have half your strength of the charging unit. So the charge bonus is going to be for flying units. Odds are this guy's going to be flying. Uh, for flying units, the charge bonus is twice their size. And then to a limit of half your strength. So in this guy's case, if these are the stats he's going to have, his charge bonus will be plus four, which is still under five strength. Cool. Cool. Um, so that's important. Uh, and these guys like blesses, very, different, very, very different blesses than what Jaguar Warriors like, in my opinion. To me, Jaguar Warriors are big sats of hits points that hit very hard. Uh, Eagle Warriors, on the uh, alternatively, they're not big sats. They're more of a dexterous, roguish kind of uh, warrior. Whereas, you know, the Jaguar Warriors is this big brute that, you know, you're hitting them all. Uh, perfect. <laughs> no, I can't say spoilers. Dang. <laughs> it's going to make a Game of Thrones spoiler of a certain uh, fight where a big brute fought a uh, nimble spearman. If you know the fight that I'm talking about, the Jaguar Warrior is the big brute. The nimble spearman is the eagle warrior. OK, so we've gone over mages. We've gone over the units. Uh, I guess I can really just jump into pretenders. Uh, yeah, why not? Let's do that. For pretenders, I'm not going to try and sell you on the kind of pretender that I make. Um, and you have a lot of choices here. You have a lot of choices. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few unique ones, I guess, first. Uh, which pr the primary one is Lawgiver. Lawgiver is a human that is also coatal. They shapeshift. So it's going to be a, a second shape kind of person, which is always good when you know worried about remote attacks. Especially like humans, human like if you, like if you choose these other guys, they can get sniped by like flames from the sky. It's much more difficult to do that to this guy. Just good. Um, despite being Dominion one, his new magic path cost is forty because he starts with three paths, and he actually does have a decent chassis because it flies. Um, so he's kind of good if you want to, you know, spread some bless, whatever, and then still have. Or, or if you don't, if you want to go higher in these paths, like you know, you you know, you're getting the, these bless points, air and nature, whatever. But the main thing I want to highlight with this pretender design, because because I'll have a separate pretender design video on, you know, the choices I made on my build and what the heck. But the main thing I want almost anybody going in as Ma Mifflin to understand for their pretender design. Um, and there's two. There's three things, I think. There's three main things I want to help people understand as best that they can. The first of which, don't take charge bodies. <laughs> this is five points. Charge bodies, major shock resistance, great. If you really don't want to die to it, you need minor shock resistance too, because it's a 10 armor negating, so you're doing a dice roll at major, and you cannot afford, your nimble spearman cannot afford to be stunned for a turn, because then he will die. Um, don't take charge bodies. Please don't take charge bodies. Please don't take charge bodies. It works sometimes. OK. It works against indies. Good. It works against normal troops. Good. The moment you run into a sacred that has 15 shock resistance, which is the most it's probably tied with fire as the most common shock resistance that you will put on a sacred. This bless does nothing. <laughs> Don't take charge bodies. Instead, I strongly recommend double swiftness. What, Zan? Why would you take double swiftness? Your troops fly. Cool. Two things. One, plus two defense. Defense is always good. The more defense you have, the better. You are a nimble spearman. You are dodging hits. You are not tanking them. Defense, good. Two, the moment someone casts Storm at you, your units are no longer flying. 
the moment somebody walks up to you with a staff of storms, your units will never fly in that battle. Before you cast Blessing, Storm is already up. Your units are walking. What do walking Eagle Warriors do at combat speed 11? They get killed by whatever the enemy has. If you want my recommendation on what to do with those extra design points, you take double swiftness. If you want to be safe, you can take regular swiftness and shock resistance. Cool. Don't take charge bodies. <laughs> right, that's point number one. Point number two. These are your scales. Cool. Any questions? Any questions? You can't talk to me because I'm in a video. Leave your comments. Those are your scales. Because we can all agree, there's no argument here. We can all agree that Eagle Warriors don't need resources. They cost three resources each. This is the only unit you're going to be producing. We can all agree you don't need resources. And, and before you come in that maybe there's something that your other units can do that this guy can't, if this guy is not the answer to your problems pre-turn 50, your bless is wrong. I will say that. You can argue with me. Write in the comments how wrong I am. But if you're playing any Age of England and the answer to your problems is not your sacred unit, I think, and you can please feel free to go through a game with veteran players, with very good players, um, and show me I'm wrong. Please do that. That's not only going to humble me, teach me different ways of playing things, um, but it will also expand the meta. And I, 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 I really enjoy when people do that and they find new and interesting ways to play nations. So if I am wrong, if there is a way that you can answer threats consistently without relying on your sacreds as Miklans, as any of the Miklans, please show me. I'd love to see this. But for now, as far as this guy goes, this guy is the answer to every single one of your problems for the majority of the game. Every single one. Anakites, Eagle Warriors. Morvarks, Eagle Warriors. Super Combatants, Eagle Warriors. Don't, I don't care how, much, how little sense it makes, it has to be your answer to that problem, because especially in the Middle Age, you don't have much else to go with. Your other option is Nawali or Capolian Ages. So do you understand why I'm saying this has to be your answer? So going back to it, this is the unit that you are recruiting from everywhere, and he costs three resources each. You don't need production scales. I'm sorry. Other Age Miklans have to recruit Jaguar Warriors. They're 31 recruitment points each. That's heavy. That's difficult. You're Middle Age to Miklan. This guy costs 14. I don't think you need uh, recruitment points either. You take Terminal 3, because you need a big bless. So those are the first two of your scales. I guess that, that would be the second point. The third point, that are, it's really important for... If there's anything in this video that you take away, this is a, it's this third point. You need to be in one of these two Dominion scales. You either Dominion 10 or you Dominion 9. As middle-aged Midland, again, I will go out and say I don't think you have any other option. You have to. Absolutely have to take one of those two scales. Because yes, you can go ahead and do Dominion 6. It will work in your single-player testing against the AI. I promise you, Dominion 6 is fine. It's going to work. The moment you run into a multiplayer game and you're recruiting a sacred that costs you 15 gold per turn. And you're recruiting five of these, maybe six if you're recruiting Nahuali out of your capital, which is another tip I'll get to later. But let's say you're recruiting six of these per turn. They're not going to trade well with the Vanheim that is also recruiting six sacreds per turn. And his six sacreds cost him 300 something golds because they're 65 each. Yours cost you 15. How do you think that trade is going to go? Your Eagle Warriors are going to get eliminated. Not to mention, if you've ever played Kalem before, if you know anything about flying expansion, the more if you have twice as many units, if you have twice as many flyers, that army is not twice as good. It's exponentially better because it has twice as many flyers. Flyers rely on numbers. So by you recruiting six of these, you are significantly lowering your combat strength to the point where every single MA Miklan I have seen played, be it in the game I'm in, in this is tournament video, in any video I've seen, any middle-aged Miklan I've seen, gets rushed. I guess, you know what? Grippa is an exception to this. He didn't get rushed. Ermor tried to attack him, I believe. 
and Ermor got attacked by everyone else, if I remember correctly. In most cases, if I see you playing Miklin and you have Dominion 6 or 5, I'm going to rush you. Because I know that Miklin doesn't get started until turn 13, 14, 15. Before that, to me, you're dead in the water. Because it might be bloody, yeah. But you don't have the production capabilities, even if you had scales, mind you. You don't have the production capabilities to push out your bless in enough numbers to worry me. So to me, you need to be Dominion 9 or Dominion 10. It's an entire scale between them for an immobile. But I think you have to. Because at Dominion 10, you're making 10 Eagle Warriors per turn out of your capital the first 10 turns. Your expansion parties, well, the expansion parties I've used is literally a Sun Priest and 19 Eagle Warriors. Because one turn, I have to, I'm going to recruit in Nawali, so I can get 10. The next turn, I'm going to recruit the Sun Priest and nine other Eagle Warriors. So in two turns, I have 19 Eagle Warriors, whereas if you had Dominion 6, you're going to have 9 or 10. You got problems there. <laughs> I hope that is a strong encouragement on this high Dominion score. Through the rest of your scales, I mean, obviously, you can do whatever you want with temperature and growth. You play that by ear. Um, magic scales, I really want to highlight that it's something you want. You don't need them. But you really, really want them because remember, you're recruiting this guy, the 70 gold mage for 7 research points. If it was suddenly a 70 gold mage for 10 research points, it's fantastic. If it's a 70 gold mage for 12 because he got a random, it's even better. Magic scales are really powerful on this nation. Um, luck scales are really powerful on this nation because the hero, there's a multi-hero you get that breaks you into death. Um, as Miklum, any, any age Miklum. But specifically the middle age Miklum, your heroes are like 10 path, 9 path. They're quaddles. You, there's two quaddles that they're like 9 or 10 path quaddles. It's insane. Uh, there's an undead looking dude that also is going to break you into death. And he can reanimate. <laughs> um, I can't remember if there's any other ones off the top of my head, but they're really, really, like all three of them are or all four, I guess the multi-hero. All the heroes for Amy Micklin are actually really, really good. Uh, so Lux kind of powerful. And it's going to get you gold that your other scales obviously won't. The balancing act that you have to take, though, is now what bless you're going to take. I'm not going to go in this video over what bless you're going to take. I just really wanted to highlight the thing about the scales. Because you can listen to the rest of the video, but if you, in my opinion, if you don't take Dominion 9 or 10, and you don't dump your Tormos Loft to afford a good enough bless, Someone could just rush you, and you're going to have a bad time, you're going to hate this nation. <laughs> so that's the gist of it. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that might be important to mention. Oh, the uh, Nahuali thing. From your capital, yes, your cap recruitment is very, very contentious. You have literally almost half your ma your commander rosters in your capital only. But at the beginning, I think you want Nahuali out of your capital. You want to alternate Nahuali and Sun Priests or Priest Kings or High Priest, whatever because it's going to get you an extra sacred. And if we go back to when I mentioned for flying combatants, double the combatants is not just double the strength. It's significantly more. And again, this goes to you want your expansion to be as attritionless as possible. Because if you're losing a lot of sacreds every fight, if someone attacks you, your pants are going to be at your ankles. And you cannot afford that or else you're dead. Because your walls aren't good. And if they're on top of your capital, you're dead too. Which, two things, by the way. Uh, your capital PD or any of your fort PD past 20 is going to start adding sacreds. For middle age, it's going to be equal wars. That can be kind of good if you get it to an extreme level, like say 50. Because now all of a sudden your cap PD also has 30 eagle warriors. It's pretty good. <laughs> um, trying to think if there's anything else that's fancy off the top of my head. Um, when, ex oh, when expanding with Eagle Warriors, it's very important. I'm going to give credit, 100% credit to Tyre Telltaler for telling me this. You don't want to do attack rear with the Eagle Warriors. You want to do attack archers. Because the most, the deadliest thing in the game to Eagle Warriors will forever be archers and javelinier's. Uh, they have nimble spearmen, cannot dodge arrows and, or javelins or boulders. Ranged fire will kill this guy. Your mages later on can cast arrow fan, they can cast mist. 
with the communion that can cast storm. All that's fine later on. You're going to research that. Don't worry about it. But early on during expansion, you want to do attack archers. Because some most of the time, the commander will be with the archers anyways, which is what you wanted with attack rear, right? And you're eliminating, using your charge bonus, the deadliest factor to your evil warriors. Uh, the other thing is your initial expansion army that's going to have these slingers. Um, that army is very important. Unless you're fighting barbarians, you want them on hold and attack. You don't want to throw. You don't want to be firing your slings into the enemies that your eagle warriors are fighting, because the slings will kill your eagle warriors for the same thing that they cannot dodge rage fire. Anything else? Um, please leave in your comments. Uh, let's have a discussion on this. Ah, oh, crud! I haven't talked about blood. Crud. Uh, this is already a very long video, so I'm definitely going to apologize for this. Uh, that is so long, but actually, blood. I need to talk about blood. This is very important. Bare minimum, your pretender god needs to have blood four, as this is also the floor. I guess I could do this in pretender design, but it's part of the nation. Your pretender god needs to have blood four as a bare minimum, because blood four is going to get you Oniki. You have a bunch of these like blood summons that you otherwise cannot do, unless you random blood on your Nahuali. They're very important. Nahuali can random blood. Very rarely. Um, you might have to bootstrap your way in with with uh, your slaves captured by tribal kings to patrol and then just scouts and just force yourself into blood. But it's very important that your pretender god has at least blood four. Because with blood four, you can summon Oniki. Oniki are blood three or sometimes blood four. One in, one in four of them are blood four. Um, mages. With you know accompanying death paths or nature or whatever, uh, with a blood hunter plus two on them. So as a blood three, they blood hunt as a blood five. As a blood four, they blood hunt as a blood six. Uh, then you give them a dowsing rod and they go one level higher. They are very good blood hunters. To me, as M. A. Micklin, this is the blood hunter that you want. Obviously, you were not getting this guy early in the game. You don't have one the research, two the cold economy to afford to try to blood hunt. But if you do, you want Onoki because they are the best blood hunters available to you. If you want pure blood slaves, maybe making Flapopuchis or Civitateos is going to get you more pure blood slaves. But, but, as M.A. Micklin, you do not, at least in your first steps into blood hunting, you do not have many blood hunters. So, you know, if you get 10 Flahopuchi and 4 Onoki, it's about the same cost here, uh, you will have spent 10 turns, 10 blood, blood, hunt, blood mage turns, summoning Flahopuchis, 10 more blood mage turns, crafting them a dowsing rod. So we're up to 20 turns to get 10 of these active, which again, as a Mimiklin, you do not have 20 blood mages. Not Early, earlier mid game, I think, at least. Whereas Onaki, you're going to spend four turns summoning Onaki, four turns equipping the Onaki. It's much faster. They will blood hunt almost at the same level. Almost. Uh, again, pure output Falhopuchi are going to give you more blood slaves, just out of the fact that you're rolling more blood blood slave dice. Uh, however, what to me breaks this, completely breaks this, is your Oniki come with eight beast bets and they Dominion summon more. And if you go back, I said you need to take Dominion 9 or 10. And if you take Dominion 9, by the time you're summoning Oniki, you're at Dominion 10. So where you're blood hunting, better have Dominion 10 in it, which can be done usually with your Pretender God. Going from 9 to 10 naturally is difficult, but your Pretender God forces that to happen with their Temple check. Um, so while these guys are blood hunting, you're also getting Sacred Beast Bats. And just a reminder on, they cost 8 Blood Slaves for 3. So it's kind of 3 Blood Slaves per Beast Bat. So you're getting 8 already when you summon the Oniki, so it's kind of like 24 Blood Slaves worth-ish, maybe a little 21. 21 Blood Slaves worth of value. But then your Onaki starts summoning three to like six of them in Dominion 10 per turn. That's a lot of value. And Beast Bats are sacred. They fly. They're stealthy. They don't hit very hard. 
but they're also three seed strength each. It's something. It's free. Uh, after you've got enough Onaki, you know, doing their blood thing, now you can turn around and get Curse of Blood to summon Vampire Lords. Your Onaki can come with Death 3, Blood 3 already. Which is why I don't I don't think you need as I mean, an blood or death on your commander, because the bless from death sucks. Unless you're taking like thousand undying. Onaki can get you into vampires. And once you have enough Onaki blood hunting for you, yeah, sure. Get vampires. Vampires are amazing. They raid. They cast spells. They do Every, they make their own respawn. They're fantastic. But if you purely just want to blood hunt, Onaki. Onaki. 10 out of 10 do recommend. They make their own their, their own patrol chaff. They make their own sacreds. They're the ones that you want. <laughs> um, Onaki can random fire and let you do Reign of Jaguars. However, you also need a million blood boosters, which they can all make, by the way. Your Onaki can random blood 4. With blood 4, you can get all the way to blood 7. Do whatever the heck you want. They can even make the... Uh, that armor, that nature blood armor that gives you boosts. They can do whatever that. Um, this is why you need at least blood four in your pretender, and that will get you up to whatever blood you want. Uh, and they can cast Reign of Jaguars. And this is like the premier Micklin sacred, but as MA Micklin, this is insanely difficult for you to get. Uh, but Oniki can do it. Me, personally, I'd rather my god do it. But uh, Reign of Jaguars, something you can do. Um, I'm not going to talk about the rest of the sacreds. I just want to point out the importance of Oniki, I guess, in terms of breaking into blood later in the game. Because later in the game, your Eagle Warriors, at the end of the day, have 10 magic resistance. And in the late game, things like Mass and Slave, Winds of Death, they're going to tear your Eagle Warriors a new one. Your Jaguar Warriors suffer the same problem. OK, finally, I apologize. It's a long video, but it's a very complex nation that I think has a few must-haves or necessities to it that whenever I don't see their, those qualifications met, I see a dead Micklin. Almost always. So I really hope this helps, guys. If you vehemently disagree with me on anything that I've said in this video, please add it to the comments. Let's talk about it. Um, I really like this nation. It can do so much. There's so many different ways for it to be played. I just think that those requirements need to be filled. But I would like to have <laughs> discussions on this. I think it's cool. So uh, yeah, that will be the guide to Middle Age Micklin. And see you guys next time.